In this lecture, we're going to cover bacterial and fungal infections of the skin. Bacterial infections are important because they're common and usually readily treatable. Infections tend to be caused by the following organisms. Gram-positive organisms such as streptococci, staphylococci and carani bacteria. Gram-negative infections such as uh, caused by pseudomonas are less common. Spirochete infections produce conditions such as syphilis and Lyme disease. Finally, we'll cover acid fast infections, and these include tuberculosis of the skin, leprosy, and atypical acid fast infections, uh, such as fish tank granulomas. It's sometimes really important to take appropriate investigations uh, to confirm or refute bacterial infections prior to starting antibiotic treatment. We can determine the presence of infection by direct microscopy in some instances. So, for example, by doing what's called dark ground staining on primary lesions of syphilis. But most commonly, we take skin swabs and these are uh, submitted for culture and also antibiotic sensitivity. Results tend to come back in about four to eight hours. Obviously, we can biopsy tissue for culture, and we tend to do this for atypical acid fast infections. And uh, results tend to take two or three weeks to come through because the bacteria are slow growing. We can do serological tests, and these are particularly useful for the diagnosis of syphilis and Lyme disease. Finally, in recent years, we've had molecular diagnosis for rapid uh, uh, investigation results for a number of bacterial infections. Almost as soon as we're born, our skin becomes covered in what is termed the normal flora. And the bacteria that we tend to get covered in are Staphylococcus epidermitis, Micrococci, Propionobacteria and some Carinibacteria. So these are all parts of the normal flora. One of the most common gram-positive infections to infect the skin uh, are caused by streptococci. Streptococci have a facility to spread. Superficial infection is called erysipelas and deeper infections, uh, again confined to the skin, produce something called cellulitis. The most important streptococcal infection, uh, which is potentially fatal, can produce a condition called necrotizing fasciitis, the so-called flesh-eating bacterium. Here you can see on a culture plate uh, a growth of streptococci, uh, which has been uh, used to identify the organism and determine its sensitivity. So let's have a look at some clinical images. This is a lady who's got erysipelas of the face. It started on the left side of her face with redness and swelling and tenderness but spread over the left side of her face and is now affecting the right side of her face. Uh, it's associated with constitutional symptoms. So there is fever. She may have rigors and localized pain. And the asym asymmetry and asymmetrical spread is quite typical of erysipelas. The face is a common situation to get erysipelas. Cellulitis is similar to erysipelas, but a slightly deeper infection. The leg, upper limbs and face are the most common sites to be affected. Cellulitis is always a unilateral disease. At first, there may be constitutional symptoms of fever, rigors, followed then by the localization of pain and then a spreading uh, redness uh, and here you can see in the leg, the redness started around the ankle, but it spread over the course of a day or two up towards the thigh. It's important that uh, we try and identify where the streptococcus has uh, gained access to the skin. And very commonly on the leg, it's uh, from the toe clefts. Here you can see somebody who's got 
uh, a vesicular eczema affecting a hand. Sometimes this is called pomphylix. But what's happened is that the hand eczema has become more tender, she's become febrile and unwell. And you can see there's spreading redness uh, extending from the wrist uh, onto the forearm. And this is called lymphangitis. And this usually uh, is the result of a streptococcal infection of the eczema, then spreading proximately up through the lymphatics. Finally, this is an example of the most serious streptococcal infection, a condition called necrotizing fasciitis. So this elderly lady developed what initially looked like cellulitis around her ankle, but she developed increasingly severe so-called crescendo pain. The redness then became very dusky, and eventually the skin became necrotic and anesthetic. Uh, she also had crepitus underneath the skin due to the formation of, of gas. And this is a, a serious uh, emergency because it needs both uh, antibiotic treatment and uh, surgical debridement. Unfortunately, this lady refused this and sadly she died. So necrotizing fasciitis is a very important and potentially fatal condition. So how do we treat streptococcal infections? Well, they need an antibiotic with uh, a, either an oral or a systemic agent. So this might be benzyl penicillin plus flucloxacillin, erythromycin or other macrolides. And for more serious infections, sometimes there's also clindamycin. In a lot of countries, this is uh, administered for more serious uh, disease by what's called outpatient antibiotic treatment. So patients uh, may attend on a daily basis to a hospital or the antibiotics are administered uh, either intravenously or intramuscularly in the community. As mentioned before, fasciitis requires treatment both with high-dose intravenous antibiotics and importantly surgical debridement. It's always remember, uh, important to remember that uh, look for and treat the portal of entry. As mentioned previously with lower leg cellulitis, this is very commonly interdigital tineopedes. So look for this and treat it, and hopefully this will prevent recurrence. Most skin staphylococcal disease is caused by the organism Staphylococcus aureus. It can produce a superficial infection called impetigo, localized infections called ecthyma, infections of the hair follicles producing superficial folliculitis or deeper infections of the hair follicles producing boils or carbuncles. Finally, there's an important condition called staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, which we'll discuss in detail later. So here's an example of impetigo affecting uh, the face. So three or four days ago, this lad developed an oozy, weepy red patch below his ear, and then he's developed lesions around there, which have extended over the uh, side of his face. Uh, the lesions often ooze and weep, and this produces honey-colored crusting, uh, which is uh, typical of uh, impetigo. Here's an example of impetigo affecting a baby. Lesions started under the armpit and they've spread onto the adjacent skin on the uh, upper chest due to direct contact of the arm with the, with, with the chest. And these are so-called kissing lesions. Lesions have spread further fairly rapidly over four or five days onto the thigh. So impetigo uh, affecting a child, honey-coloured crusting is typical. Some of the strains of uh, Staphylococcus aureus produce a toxin called the epidermolytic toxin, and this produces superficial separation within the epidermis, producing superficial friable blisters. So on the centre of this frame here, you can see a blister, uh, other similar blisters have ruptured, producing this honey-coloured crusting. So this is called bullus impetigo. 
unfortunately, rarely a distant staphylococcal infection can produce large amounts of this epidermolytic toxin. And this can produce widespread separation uh, within the epidermis, producing superficial blistering. And this is called staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. So this lady had recently had coronary artery surgery and developed a staphylococcal uh, stenotomy wound infection. Unfortunately, this uh, uh, infection produced large amounts of the um, uh, epidermolytic toxin. Uh, her skin went bright red and you can see all this superficial blistering and peeling of the outer layers of the epidermis. Um, so staphylococcal scalded skin, an uncommon condition, tends to occur more commonly in children. When it does occur in adults, it's often associated with uh, immunosuppression. Staphylococci are a common cause of superficial infection of the hair follicles. So this produces a condition called folliculitis. There are many causes of folliculitis. Uh, so it can be caused by staphylococci, yeasts. Uh, you can have sterile folliculitis caused by topical agents such as tar. But staphylococcal infection uh, is one of the most common causes of folliculitis. The final staphylococcal infection we'll consider is a condition called ecthyma. This produces small punched out ulcers with overlying crusts. Very often it's a mixed infection, staphylococcus aureus and streptococci, and it tends to occur particularly in the undernourished. Deeper infection of the hair follicles produce what are called furuncles or boils. They may be single or multiple. Lesions tend to be tender, painful and red and eventually they'll point and discharge pus. Uh, there's a variant of Staphylococcus aureus called Panton valentine leucocidin. Now this ba bacterium produces uh, a toxin which prevents the normal functioning of leukocytes and it can produce very painful and recalcitrant furunculosis. Uh, it tends to occur more commonly in institutions such as boarding schools, uh, military barracks, those kind of environments. Uh, and it can spread from person to person quite easily. So with extensive recurrent boils, PVL, Staphylococcus aureus, needs to be uh, considered. So how do we manage staphylococcal infection? Well, staphylococcal infections are quite contagious. So it is important to think carefully about hand hygiene, uh, utilizing uh, individuals' own towels, not sharing um, uh, towels and uh, flannels, etc. With impetigo, if the impetigo is limited, we can use a topical antibiotic such as mupiracin. But if people have got more extensive disease, then we'd use an oral antibiotic such as flucloxacillin or a macrolide such as erythromycin or azithromycin. Furuncles, if they're caught early, will respond to antibiotics, but large boils may require drainage and release of the pus can hasten the resolution and relieve the pain quite quickly. It's important to consider nasal carriage. So people who are getting recurrent boils may harbour staphylococci in their nose and uh, antibiotics will only temporarily clear this. Uh, so it's important to try and eradicate nasal carriage. And we do this by using uh, an antiseptic such as naseptin. So this is uh, an agent which contains both chlorhexidine and neomycin. And we apply this into each nostril twice daily for a week every month for six months to prevent recolonization of the nose, which allows reinfection elsewhere. So also consider whether other family members may be harboring staphylococci, keeping uh, outbreaks of uh, staphylococcal infection going. Carini bacteria can produce two different skin infections. 
a condition called erythrasma and a condition called pitted keratolysis. Erythrasma tends to affect the flexural areas such as the axilla and groins and it may also affect the web spaces of the toes. Uh, here you can see in the groin erythrasma in natural light and produces this superficial brown slightly scaly eruption. But now we can see the same area illuminated by what's called a woods light which is a small handheld uh, fluorescent light and here you can see that the areas of erythrasma are fluorescing this beautiful coral pink colour and that's because the carini bacteria metabolize uh, uh, agents in the skin to produce porphyrins and it's these porphyrins which are fluorescing so woods light is a quick way of uh, identifying uh, erythrasma Erythra erythrasma can be treated with a topical azole such as myconazole or clotrimazole or an oral macrolide such as erythromycin or azithromycin. Another carinobacterial infection produces a condition called pitted keratolysis. This occurs most commonly on the feet, particularly between the toe webs, on the toes, over the forefoot or on the heel and it's recognized uh, by a honeycomb like pitting and that can be seen particularly over the uh, lateral aspect of the big toe it's often associated with hyperhidrosis and foot malodor so a lot of the treatment of this is uh, to try and uh, keep the feet as dry as possible uh, so uh, treat the hyperhidrosis, try and prevent people walking around in occlusive footwear, wearing sandals to try and keep the feet dry, and then eradicating the cause of organism by using something like topical clindamycin, topical erythromycin, fusidic acid, or an oral macrolide to eradicate the causative bacterium. One of the more common gram-negative bacteria produce, to produce skin infections is Pseudomonas. And uh, it quite commonly will affect areas that are getting damp or wet, such, such as exudative wounds. We can often recognise the presence of Pseudomonas infection by a green discoloration of dressings. Pseudomonas can also uh, uh, colonize hot tubs and it can produce uh, an infective folliculitis sometimes called hot tub or jacuzzi folliculitis. Here's a lady who's uh, got a condition called onycholysis where there's been separation of the nail plate from the nail bed below and this gives a space into which water can collect and when water collects there, it's then very easy for this to become colonized with pseudomonas. The pseudomonas produces a green pigment, producing this change in color of the nail plate. This lady here had uh, been uh, uh, using a hot tub over the course of one weekend and four or five days later, she was covered in small, painful pustules uh, over her trunk. Swabs of these uh, pustules grew pseudomonas. So this is pseudomonas, or hot tub or jacuzzi folliculitis. So it's important that if people develop this, the uh, jacuzzi is uh, adequately cleaned to eradicate the causative organism very often the folliculitis will resolve spontaneously, but if people are unwell, we'd use an oral course of ciprofloxacin for five days to eradicate the pseudomonas. Moving on to spirochete infections. Uh, one of the most important uh, spirochete infections to affect humans uh, is caused by the organism Borrelia burgdorferi, and this produces uh, Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme disease is spread by uh, an infected tick. Um, 
the host reservoir for Lyme disease uh, is usually animals such as deer, rodents and rabbits. So ticks which feed on these animals may become infected by the Borrelia burgdorferi and then animals may become, an, uh, sorry, humans may then become an accidental end host. Uh, the uh, infection it can then be transmitted to humans and it can produce a variety of conditions. It will produce a skin condition called erythema chronica migrans, but it may also then be complicated by infection of the nervous system producing neuritis and encephalitis, infection of the heart and myocarditis, and uh, late sequelae might produce a both joint disease, a chronic arthritis, and other chronic skin problems. So here you can see an example of something called erythema chronic and migrans. So this uh, lad was bitten by an infected tick in the center of his chest and he's had a slowly spreading red ring which is slowly spread over the course of about two or three weeks and will slowly extend uh, around his body uh, over the course of six to eight weeks. So this is erythema chronica migrans, uh, the uh, skin sign of early Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme disease uh, can be diagnosed uh, serologically, uh, but this uh, might take up to four to six weeks for seroconversion to occur. So Early Lyme disease is treated on the basis of clinical suspicion and then retrospective uh, diagnoses can be made serologically. Early Lyme disease with purely cutaneous disease, uh, cutaneous lesions will be treated by high dose tetracyclines, usually doxycycline. Children obviously can't be treated with tetracyclines because of the effect of tetracyclines on teeth. So they tend to be treated with penicillins or macrolides. With uh, anybody who's got either neurological or cardiac disease, they would need intravenous uh, cephalosporins. The other important spirochete disease to affect uh, humans is syphilis. This is caused by treponema pallidum. Primary infection uh, is called a chancre. And this will be acquired from someone else who's got syphilis. Uh, shankers will start usually within seven days of uh, acquiring the infection. And common sites to be affected are the penis, vulva, vagina, lip, mouth and anus. And these tend to produce an indurated, painless ulcer in the affected area. If this is untreated, a proportion of people will go on to produce what is called secondary syphilis. And this can occur between six weeks and six months of the infection. Uh, it uh, will produce perhaps a flu-like illness with an associated lymphadenopathy and then a coppery coloured scaly rash which occurs on the trunk, limbs, palms and soles. And there may also be mucosal lesions which are called condyloma tillata and snail track ulcers. Again if this is untreated uh, people can progress on to produce what's called tertiary disease which can affect the heart, the nervous system and the skin. So here's an example of a primary lesion of syphilis, a chancre. Uh, it's occurring on the penis has produced an, produced an indurated, painless ulcer. And you can see around the edge, there's this uh, so-called wash leather slough. And this is uh, developed uh, seven to 14 days after acquiring syphilis from another infected individual. Primary lesions are increasingly being recognized uh, on the lip and in the mouth. And again, they'll produce an indurated, painless ulcer on the tongue or on the lip. Untreated primary syphilis can then progress on 
to what's called secondary syphilis. And this occurs within six weeks or six months of the uh, primary infection. It produces an often widespread eruption of coppery coloured, slightly scaly lesions over the trunk. But one of the important features that is seen in secondary syphilis are coppery coloured scaly patches which tend to occur on the sole as shown in this image here but also on the palm. So it is important anybody who's got a papular squamous eruption look carefully at their palms and their soles uh, because that should alert you to the possibility of this being secondary syphilis. Mucosal lesions may occur in secondary syphilis and it produces uh, lesions which can sometimes look a bit like viral warts, but these are called condylometallata. Importantly, lesions of both primary syphilis and mucosal lesions of secondary syphilis are highly infectious and uh, will be teeming with infectious treponema uh, pallidum. So that's how uh, syphilis uh, is so infectious. So moving on now to acid fast infections. Uh, worldwide, one of the most common uh, acid fast infections uh, is uh, leprosy. And this is a chronic infection caused by mycobacterium leprae. Leprosy has a predilection for both the skin and the nerves and it produces a granulomatous uh, inflammation. There are generally two ends of the leprosy spectrum uh, dependent upon the individual's cell-mediated immunity. So if an individual's got high cell-mediated immunity, it produces a localized uh, leprosy lesion called tuberculoid leprosy. People who've got low cell-mediated immunity will produce a more diffuse condition called lepromatous leprosy. And we'll look at some examples now. So this is a lady who uh, originated from India and she presented with a scaly plaque on the dorsal aspect of her foot. Uh, she hadn't noticed this, but the area was anaesthetic to both soft touch and pin. And what you can also see over her ankle are thickened nerves. So this is tuberculoid leprosy. A biopsy showed granulomatous inflammation with only very few um, uh, mycobacteria being visible on microscopy. Here's another example of tuberculoid leprosy in an Indian. Um, you can see these hypopigmented, slightly thickened patches on the arm. But these uh, areas were anaesthetic, they were anhydrotic, and also uh, piloerection didn't occur in the affected area due to the uh, cutaneous nerves being damaged by the uh, lepromatous infection. So this is tuberculoid leprosy, producing areas of hypopigmentation particularly. Now at the other end of the immunological spectrum, uh, here's somebody who's got lepromatous leprosy, which is just producing this diffuse thickening of the skin of the ear. The little scar you can see on his ear lobe is where the skin has been slit with a scalpel blade serum is being expressed from it and within this one could see abundant uh, bacilli. So this is lepromatous leprosy, low cell mediated immunity, abundant uh, mycobacteria noted on microscopy. Uh, one of the problems with leprosy is that the infection infects the nerves and this can produce both a motor neuropathy and a sensory, sensory neuropathy. And of course, the sensory neuropathy uh, gives rise to anaesthetic fingers, which are easily injured and burnt. And this can lead to deformity and loss of digits uh, eventually. Other acid fast infections are uh, caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, which produces TB. And atypical infections uh, 
particularly uh, my, caused by Mycobacterium marinum, which produce fish tank granulomas. So I'll have a look at some examples of these now. So here's uh, an example of a type of tuberculosis affecting the skin. This is called lupus vulgaris. This lady's history is that she's got a 20-year history of a slowly spreading, slightly thickened uh, plaque on the right cheek. So she had had a small pulmonary focus of tuberculosis. It had spread through her bloodstream, uh, and then infected her skin, and this has slowly spread over many, many years. Biopsy showed granulomatous inflammation, and microscopy uh, eventually demonstrate the presence of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is uh, infection of the skin, lupus vulgaris, one of the most common uh, manifestations of cutaneous tuberculosis. One of the more common mycobacterial in infections we see of the skin is caused by mycobacterium marinum. And this tends to be acquired either from fish or from wet environments like swimming pools. Uh, the infection is most common on the hand or the foot. And lesions may be either solitary or multiple. So this is a solitary lesion. It had been acquired from uh, injuring uh, the back of the hand whilst cleaning an infected fish tank. And it's produces this, produced this purpley, slightly scaly plaque on the back of a knuckle. And here's the hand of another fish keeper. Again, he'd been cleaning his fish tank uh, out. The fish were infected. It hasn't been wearing a glove. He's injured his uh, middle finger whilst cleaning the tank. The infections got in and spread up the lymphatics. Uh, producing these abscesses along the line of the, lymph the lymphatic spreading proximally. So this is called sporotrichoid spread. It's called that because it looks similar to a very uncommon condition that we don't really see in the UK called sporotrichosis. It's more common in the US. So, but it produces this sporotrichoid spread, proximal spread of abscesses up the lymphatics. Uh, these atypical acid fast infections do need treating with antibiotics and they usually need uh, three months treatment with either a combination of rifampicin and isoniazid or a broad spectrum tetracycline or a macrolide such as azithromycin.